I was in shock, absolute shock. I looked at the door and saw the light there and something just didn't seem right. So that's when I saw. And what does he say to you? He said that I'm only here to burglarize you. I don't want to hurt you, but if you scream, if you make any noise, I'll shoot you. And the next thing I remember is he was on top of me in the bed. He betrayed everybody here. He betrayed this whole community. They've got the wrong man. Who am I going to believe? You got to put me in set. Meet Jeffrey Pilo, a former Bloomington police sergeant, once seen as a dedicated officer and family man. However, his life took a dark turn in 2006 when he was arrested for stalking and serial rape. Following a stranger danger call to the police, his double life was revealed. To understand the extent of his crimes, let's rewind to December 2002, when Jeffrey Pilo began his reign of terror. Armed with a firearm and knife, he would break into victims' homes, threatening and sexually assaulting them. As a police officer, he used his position to evade consequences, accessing personal information, and checking if his car was reported stolen. Equipped with burglary tools like gloves, rope, ski masks, coats, and knives, he arranged four rapes between 2002 and 2005. Fast forward to April 2005, when his nearly fifth victim became his downfall. Meet Jonel Pengaluska, also known as JP. On April 5th, 2005, she received numerous hang-up calls at work, provoking unease. Requesting a male colleague's escort to her car, she observed a suspicious man behind her vehicle as she left. Describing him as a white male with distinctive features, she felt alarmed. Fast forward to April 10th, 2005, JP and her boyfriend, Scott Galuska, returned home to Bloomington around 10 p.m. later. Galuska woke her, claiming to have seen a figure in black gloves in their yard. Calling the police, Galuska confronted the intruder with a baseball bat, leading to a heated exchange before the intruder fled, marking a crucial moment in Pello's downfall. On June 10, 2006, JP returned home around midnight, noticing her dog restless. She heard urgent knocking but found no one at the door. Moments later, the doorbell rang again, and she spotted Nolan. Alarmed by noises outside, she called the police. Officer David Zemer arrived and was surprised to find his superior, Sergeant Jeffrey Pello, nearby. Despite recognizing Pello, Zemer proceeded with the arrest. The following day, Pello was brought in for questioning, and tensions quickly escalated as soon as he took his seat. Are you good? Are you saying that? No. What's going on? This isn't the way we want this to happen, right? We want you to come down here and go and all kinds of stuff. We said chat and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. You know, you went down with the same uh, with with Mosier, and um, as you know, we have rules that we have to go by. Just as you know, you're very familiar with all this stuff. You know what's going on, all kind of stuff. And we want to talk about what's going on because we're not absolutely sure what's going on. And kind of, what are you talking about? I have to read your rights first. I want to arrest at this point. Uh, you're not free to go. At this point. I'm under arrest. If I'm not free to go, I'm under arrest. Well, we're in a custodial situation. That's why I'm going to read you your rights. Right. Because you came, because you came down here in uh, their car. I don't know where we're going to go. I don't know where we're going to I don't know where we're going to go. I don't even know what you're talking about. I understand that, Jeff. And you understand, just like I do, that I can't talk about anything until we get this little bit out. Being a seasoned officer, Pello should have understood that being in custody meant he couldn't leave freely. His resistance to this basic understanding only added to his guilt. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have one present with you about any question. If you can afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before the question if you wish. You can decide any time to exercise these rights. Not answer your questions or make any statements. Do you understand those rights I explained to you? Yes, of course I do. Okay. I have those rights in mind you wish to speak with me. About what? Okay. Well, last night, all right, there was a, a, an issue that came up, right, out on the uh, southwest side of town, all right? 
you know what I'm talking about? There's a, it's a, I want to hear what you have to say about it. And I'm, I'm really hoping there is a good explanation for it all. I, did you meet up with police officer last night? You're talking about Zeno. Yes. When I was walking around by the lake, looking at the lake down there. Again, I drove down there. I couldn't sleep. All right. Houses come up for sale in that area all the time. I'm interested in buying my mother-in-law a house. She lives up in Ridley. Uh, she's, you know, she's poor. She's on fixed income. I want her to move closer to us. Houses come for sale. There's a town home right there for sale. It won't work. But anyway, I was looking to see what kind of access went down to that lake. That's all. All right, I was starting to walk around, I would park, walk down, looked at the lake when I was leaving. Where did you park it? I don't know the name of the street. But it wasn't right there where you ran. It was by the lake. That lake is goes behind those houses. You know, you understand how difficult the situation this is for everyone involved, including yourself, really. All yes, right. I understand. And irregardless of what you know, our feelings are towards each other and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I think we've always got along. I think we've always been able to speak openly about that. There's just some things that happened last night that just doesn't add up. And you know, Jeff, you know, as a former investigator yourself, that there are things that we know, okay, such as the, the way that uh, uh, you met up with David, you know, you, you freaked him out. Um, why would you be? Why would you be in between two houses looking at? Because I, I, I couldn't keep going straight. There's a drainage thing that goes down the lake. I couldn't keep walking, so I walked up. The dog started barking. And all hell. So I walked up between the houses and go to the road. All right. He comes around. I thought maybe it was the homeowner. I was like, oh, I don't want to startle. You know, he startled me. So I turned to walk back down. He said, "Stop, please." I was like, "Oh, hell, it's got." I turned around and walked back. Jeff. Jeff. Well, you know, as being a police officer, that that kind of that kind of thing is not within the norm. We don't, as police officers, we don't walk around at twelve thirty at night in the morning, walking in between the houses. I walked up walk between the houses. I was by the lake, but I couldn't keep going, so I walked up between the houses. That's it. I mean, that is it. I, I, that's it. Think about what you're telling me. I am thinking about what I'm telling you. The truth. I went down there, look, what kind of public access is down there? I walked, I started going to the west side, but there's fences, are, and I was, oh, hell, I come back around the other way, all right? Again, I can't go no further. There's a drainage thing that comes down and fills that, like, overflow, I guess. I don't know what it is. So I started, you know, the dog started barking, so I walked up between the houses, go up to the road, and yes, to be on the road, so I'm not walking up between, you know, it's just, ugh. Well, wait, wait a minute. But you weren't on the road until I was going to the other road. All right. That's what I was walking up to was go up to the road, walk down to my truck and drive away because I was done looking at the lake. There's no access going down the lake. So, okay, Jeff, okay, Jeff. We're past the point of you were there, right? You readily admit that you were there. Yes. In between those two houses. Yes. All right. I was just walking from the lake up to the, okay. If you get a call of someone walking in between two houses at 1230 in the morning, I don't know what call brought him out there. Yes, of course. Of course. I mean, the person who yes, called this in has every right in the world to do this, correct? I have no idea who called it. He stresses that he was at the lake to relax his mind and scout houses, yet his actions, like moving between houses at night, seem suspicious. Within three minutes, his behavior already suggests guilt. As a police officer, he should have been more cautious. Over the next few minutes, he resorts to denial and anger, perhaps hoping to downplay the situation within the department. All right, it, what they called in wasn't me. All right, they said last night somebody knocked on somebody's door. I didn't knock on anybody's door. I did not knock on anybody's door. I, I did not knock on anybody's door. I, I don't know what else you're trying to allege here. I, I don't want to jump to some kind of conclusion. Right. All this isn't about because I was walking, I walked up between that, from that lake up between those two houses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. You know, I, I don't know what else you're talking about. We're talking about you standing up with your back to the the house and, uh, and trying not to be identified. What? You're having your back up against the house and not trying to be seen as David walks by. I was walking up, 
I saw someone coming, so I stopped. I turned to go back. Again, I, the dog's barking. I didn't want somebody to think I was doing something wrong. He said, stop police. I was like, oh, hell. So I turned around and walked up to him. I wasn't standing with my back against no house. Well, I, I think you're minimizing all of I'm not minimizing anything. He said, stop police. Wasn't there a little bit more than that? No, that's what he said. You didn't see the gun he had pulled on you? No. You were unaware that he pulled a gun on you? I did not know he did that. No, I did not. When I turned and walked towards him, so we could see who it was, that I wasn't a threat. Well, you know, his hand was at his side. He was like, we talked for, for what? We talked for a moment. What did you talk about? He asked me what I was doing. I told him what I was doing. That you were there to look for a house for your mother in law at 12 30 in the morning. I'm interested in houses in that area. There's that lake. I was looking to see what kind of access there is down to that lake. My mother's disabled. I mean, she, she can walk, but she can't walk too far. Well, I didn't see any access down there. I mean, north of the coast, I can go down there. But as far as a, a public sidewalk going down there, I didn't see one. I was going to walk back around and then go to my truck and leave. See, you, you know all the, all the things we say. You've been sitting in this chair before. All I'm saying is that what you need to do is think about just exactly what you're saying. Before you answer, before you, before you jump back with a conclusion, Jeff, you need to think about what you're saying. You need to think about what the scenario was right there. You know, I, you may be honest with him. Haven't you done? I mean, I, I mean, I think I need to take a step further. Okay, because the lady, scared to death, scared. To I don't know nothing death. about the lady. But I'm, what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is, I'm, I'm telling you, she was scared to death. She was an absolute basket case. It wasn't for me. What? Yes, you were in between the houses. You were in between the houses. What if this would have happened? I am not the between the houses. The yeah. was there. That's the only time I went between the houses. What if this would have happened? Would you be a little bit concerned talking to her? But I don't understand what you're saying. The only time I walked between those two houses was when I was walking from the lake and up. And But that's what... That's right. where you and that's when I met the Zemer. That's when you, where you and Officer Zemer differ in what you said. But whatever the lady was scared of, it wasn't me. It was you. How could it not be? The only time I was between the houses when I walked up and Zemer was there, she'd already called. Jeff, Zemer had already been throughout the whole area. You were the only person there. It was 12 30 in the morning. All right. It was 12 30 in the morning. The only time I walked up between the houses, all right, those two houses, was when Zemer came in. Alright? I mean, I walk up between, I walk from the lake, between the houses, there's a Obviously, I'm not the one scared of women because that's the only time I was there. But you wanted out of there quick. You didn't, you didn't stop and, you know, you said, I'm here looking. You think it, let's just run all the way down the line. He's on a call. I'm not going to stay there and talk to him. With you. you. With you, Jeff. Think about it. I mean, it just, it is just right down the line. Right down what line? I mean, he's called out there. All right. There's nobody else out there but you. This lady has someone prowling around her windows. She's a very attractive young lady. It wasn't me. I wasn't prowling around anyone's windows. I wasn't prowling around at all. Again, when the dog's barking, I said, I need to go up by the road, and that's when I walked between the houses. Well, what makes you decide to go look at a house at 1 30, I mean, 12 30 in the morning? I wasn't looking into houses. I'm interested in a house in the area. I was looking at that lake. Officer Zemer responded to the woman's call and testified in court that he saw a person near JP's house with their back against another house. When ordered to approach, the person initially walked away with hands near the waistband. Zemer drew his firearm, commanding the person to stop, but they continued. However, upon reaching the back of the house, the person turned and walked toward Zemer, whom he recognized as his former supervisor. Notably, Zemer observed something under the person's shirt before releasing him. This contradicts Palo's account. Palo's claim of only passing the house once seems uncertain, given the woman's complaint about his persistent presence outside. I just... Do anything wrong? I ha I, we, we as police officers, and we as human beings know the difference between right and wrong. 
It's yes. it is put in our head from I understand day one. All right. I did not walk between that. I again the only time I walked between those two houses is when I walked I was down on the lake, I can't get my front hand. So I walked up to go up to the road. That's it. Okay. And when I walk up there, somebody comes running. All right. Okay. Uh, what were you wearing last night? A t-shirt, shorts, flip flops and socks. Not flip flops, sandals. Um, did your t-shirt have any writing on it? I don't remember what my shirt had on it. What color was your shirt? Dark. What about your shorts? I think they were my black shorts. Okay. Were you carrying anything else with you? No. Nothing. Nothing. What were my car keys? Where were they at? My pockets. Jeff, I, I, I just, I've always liked you. I understand that. And then and, and you understand right. how difficult this is for I understand how difficult it is for you and everybody involved. I understand that. I and but I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm a realist. I'm a realist. I understand. And I, and I think there's a whole lot more going on here than than we're and and, and I'm and I'm not only Jeff to sit here all day long and and talk about it. I, I understand. All right. I there's something right here that, you know, you're a police officer. You know right from wrong. And I understand. I think you did wrong last night, and you think you did wrong last night. And I need to know why you did wrong. Because there's I a, didn't do anything wrong. Walking up from that lane towards the road is the right thing to do at that point. I mean, I can't go before the dog. Okay, so I walked up there. I mean, I mean if it wasn't for the thing, I would just walk around the lane and went right back to where my truck was at. I mean, that is all. I'm not... <laughs> You know, I'm not minimizing anything. Uh, you are minimizing anything. You know no, I'm not. I'm not minimizing anything. I just, I mean, I don't know how simple it is. It's not, I, it's, it's, okay. it's not that simple. I didn't have ill intent of any kind. It's not that It's not that simple. I mean, that's it. It's not that simple. I mean, she is a young, attractive lady. I don't know who she is. Um, and like I said, I, I know, you know, I've seen you. I've seen you, how you, you take a genuine interest in people. Okay, and I think if you knew what you did to this person, because I'm telling you, she's I freaking did not do it. Palo continues to deny any involvement, sticking firmly to his version of events. The idea that he innocently searched for a property at night appears highly improbable. Can I walk up from the lake between the houses on the road? Yes, I did. Okay, you were there, right? Yes, yes, I was there. Okay, you were confronted by Officer Zebra. Yes, yes, he was there. I was walking up. Okay. Okay, Let, let's just go with this in chronological order. First of all, is there any reason that you can tell me why David Zimmer would lie about this situation? Because I'll tell you what, he's freaked out too. Because you're one of his mentors. All right. You're one of his mentors. He is, I don't know how I freaked him out. You don't know how he freaked out. Well, I mean, he couldn't even hardly talk. He was so upset by the situation. He talked about how you were, you know, one of his mentors. You were his FTO uh, training sergeant. All right. And I mean, he looked up to you. All right, I understand that. All right. And, okay, so getting back to the, the question, is there any reason why David Zemer would lie about what happened? Officer Zemer, struggling with the situation, found it hard to believe his mentor could be involved. Pello's obvious indifference to Zemer's struggle shows selfishness in his actions. As a matter of fact, he called off the second unit after he confronted you. Neither do I. I don't have any reason why. Everybody has their battles, and everybody has their crosses to bear. All right, I understand. All right? And you you're, you know where we're getting at on this kind of stuff. No, I don't. You don't know what you're doing. I'm talking I, about a, a, a young, very attractive female. I don't know who you're talking about. All right? She's the lady in one of those two houses. All right. I don't know. I, I have no idea who in, lives in either one of those houses. All right. I wasn't interested in those houses. I, I'm, I'm sure you had no idea who they were. All right. I wasn't interested in those houses. All right. You weren't interested in lake access. All right. Come, come on, Jeff. All right. I mean, yes. I mean, that's a, that is just a, it doesn't make sense to anyone. All right. It well, doesn't make sense. Again, does it? Yes, it makes sense to me because that's what I went there to do. If I'm going to look at a lake access, I'm not going to do it at 1230 in the morning. All right, poor choice of times, but that's why I did it. All right, I just walked down there. All right, you're, 
What are you, 17 years? Yeah. 17 years of being a police officer. I mean, I understand. And, and, and you don't think that that is a, a severe error in judgment to be, all right, in between two houses at 12.30 in the morning, you saw what I was doing was walking from the lake to the road, all right? You're implying that I'm doing something mysterious between these houses, and all I'm doing is walking from the lake up to the road. I said, I, that's exactly what I'm implying, Jeff. That's it. That's all Because doing. Officer Zemer, who has, who you agree to, says has no reason to lie about this, says that you were up against the house, and he had, and he had to, he had to call for you three different times. No, he didn't call three different times. And then you turned around and walked the other way. Okay. When I saw the figure standing, standing there, I was like, ah, I just turned and walked back. All right. he, okay. What did he say to you then? When you returned around and he was left back, what did he say to you then? Stop, please. And what else was he saying to you? Stop, please. Let me see your hands. I don't recall everything he said. I just said, stop, please. I, went, I realized, oh, what is the police? So I turned and walked back. Right. I mean, I, if I realized at first he was, he was, he was, he was Officer Zemer, I just kept walking right toward him. Right? But my initial thought was, there was someone that lived there. I said, oh, man, that's it. Yeah, you know it's not good. You know, that's it. It's not good. That's it. Because the scenario doesn't fit. And you know what the scenario doesn't fit. That's it. There's, and, and, and here comes this old BS, but I think you've seen me interview enough people that... I'm just letting you know the line to it. No, I understand. Something, something is wrong. All right. Something's wrong. I understand. You think something's wrong. Right. I... I'm convinced. I'm convinced that wrong. Whatever scared that woman was not me. All right. The only time I walked away from that house is when I encountered Officer Zimmer. That's it. All right. I wasn't there before that at any other time. Whatever scared her, whatever it was, all right, or whoever it was, was not me. Continuously denying and showing signs of nervousness, Pello faces an interrogator who is well aware of the facts. Zimmer, with no motive against his superior was utterly shocked to see him at the scene. Pello's denial, coupled with his nervous gestures like smacking his leg, suggests guilt and an attempt to hide the true purpose of his visit. Lacking a reasonable explanation, he becomes agitated when confronted with the inconsistencies in his statements. That doesn't make sense. Obviously, it doesn't make sense. I, I'm just being real with you, Jeff. I understand. I don't know what else to tell you. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I, had, I did not... The only time I went between those houses is when I walked up and met Officer Zemer. I did not do anything to anybody anywhere last night. Period. I, I don't know what you're trying to allege here. I did not do anything to anybody at any point in time. All right? I'm not looking in some woman's windows. I'm not doing any of that. I walked down by that lake. When, said, that's what you said a minute ago. That you were looking. You said somebody something. was walking around looking in this woman's hat windows. It was not me. Whoever it was, I have no goddamn clue. I don't, oh, God, then what's what's what? I don't know that I said I, You know, I don't know how else to say it, all right? All right, the truth is the truth. I've already told it to you, and that's that. I don't know what else to do. Excuse me for getting pissed off here, but I didn't do anything wrong, all right? I did not do anything wrong, right. period. I don't know how else to put it. I don't know how else to do it. I, I don't. I don't. Well, as as it's happened in the past, you know, but, and, and I'll just tell you, I, I'll tell you point blank. I don't think the story is exactly the way you're telling it. I don't, I don't know what Dave Zimmer told you. All right, I I don't know what his perception of it was, but the only time oh, I his, his perception is right on, Jeff. His perception is right on, exactly right on. Again, I and, 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 and here and here's the real story of it all, Jeff. You're the one who has to answer for it, not David Zimmer. David Zimmer was on patrol. Answer. I'm not alleging he did anything wrong. All right, all right. I'm not. Again, I don't know what his perception of it was. I didn't do anything wrong. And I had no intent. All I did was walk in that lake and up between those houses. All right? You know, now that I'm sitting in an interview room and accused of being a criminal, obviously I should have turned and walked back 50 feet and walked up onto the, uh, the cold is right now. Yeah, cold is right there. Obviously, you should have done what again? I should have walked all the way back to where there's no houses and I walked up to the cold is Obviously, that's what, you know, looking back on it, perhaps that's what I should have done. I, oh my God. It's not anything wrong. Huh? Is that how you came around to the empty lot to see the, the spillway? There's no spillway there. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you call that. At the end of the cul-de-sac. Right. Is that the way you went around? Originally, I started to come down off of whatever, I can't remember which street it is. Come down, all right. I, 
Like when it's over, up on the street, whatever that street's called. Uh, I can't remember the name of the street. Andy, Andy Court. Walk down to where that cul de sac is, looked at that townhouse, did not, I didn't go up to the windows of the townhouse. I looked at it from a distance to see if two story, whatever it was. If that's the one that was for sale, it was. I walked down by the lake, started going on the west side. It's like, no, I don't want to go that way. So I started to come around on the east side, walked around. That's where the little spillway thing comes down in there. I don't know what you mean by spillway now. I realized, okay, I, I can't cross that. That's when I turned and walked to the front of the house. Well, actually, I went down a little ways, realized that, went back. You know, one house had a fence, I believe. So I walked back. I guess it was one house, walked up between the houses, and that's when I met Officer Zimmer. What were you we driving last night? My pickup truck. Would you take a minute and think about it? If you take a minute and you think about it, you put all I don't have things. to think about it. You put That's what happened. You put all the things together, uh, Jeff. That happened. All right. I did. Yeah. And you come up to a conclusion. How it may seem all right, is not, it's just a coincidence. It's yes. just a coincidence. I didn't do anything wrong last night. I didn't do anything to anyone. You didn't do anything to anyone. I didn't do any one thing to anyone. Pello's responses become repetitive, characterized by relentless denial and evident frustration when confronted with inconsistencies. Given a moment alone to reconsider his story and potentially confess, he returns unchanged, persisting in denial like a broken record player. The interrogator focuses on Pello's interaction with Officer Zemer, particularly his failure to notice the firearm. You have got to be thinking that this isn't some fishing expedition. We just didn't pick you out of the clear blue sky to come in. All right, correct? Obviously. Again, the only thing I did was walk from the lake in between two houses out to up to the road, out to office. That was up the road. Right. And when I realized somebody was up there, I was like, and when they turned to go back, and that's what he said. And I turned around and came back to him. Okay. But we're leaving out this. We're leaving out you. We're standing up against the wall like this. That did not occur. And an officer. That did not occur. You twice. That did not occur. And then you no. turning no. and no. walking away. Did I turn? Your hands right here. And he no. says, "Stop! Show me your hands." And he has. And I mean, you've been in the ERU. I understand. You have been in. You're a weapons guy. You're a former military. I understand. And you're telling me you didn't know somebody had a gun pointed at you? He's backlit. I wasn't paying attention to that. You weren't right. paying attention to something. He said, stop. And I said, oops. It's the play. I turned and walked up there. That's that. I talked with him a few minutes, and not even a few minutes. All right? You know, he's obviously on a call. <laughs> there's problems here, Jeff. There's, there's all kinds of problems. All right. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to, to sit here and tell you that it's all rosy and all that kind of stuff, but no. And you know where I'm coming from because I've told you. I am not buying what you're telling me. I don't one second. For one second. You know that I've done this for a long time and you have done it for yes, I have. You have done it for a long time. And I and I have anything wrong with I know you I know. And you know what? How many times have we sat in here and listened to somebody for hours and did not do something well, they did? I, I'm not going to be here for hours and then telling you that I didn't do anything wrong. And then, you know, and have all the behaviors and all the things that are happening. You know, you were not Sergeant Pilo last night. You were absolutely somebody else. And we can sit here and you can say, this is what I did. And I can sit here and say, this is what we know till the cows come out. But you know... You know in your heart exactly what happened. Yes. Yes. I went down, looked at that lake, walked up between those houses, go back to the road, put on my truck, and that's what happened. That was the only time I was between those houses. And say when we talk. Pello's commitment to his lie makes it clear that appealing any admission of wrongdoing is useless. After a prolonged exchange, the interrogation concludes and the investigation moves forward. In June 2006, Pello faced 37 charges of criminal conduct from two separate cases. The state alleged that between December 2002 and June 2006, he committed various crimes, including stalking, intimidation, home invasion, burglary, unlawful restraint, and aggravated sexual assault against five women in the Bloomington Normal community. The trial, commencing in May 2008, featured over 60 witnesses called by the state. 
testimonies from four rape victims, identified as AM, KH, Alabama, and SK, recounted their disturbing experiences from those nights. During her testimony, AM recounted waking up in December 2002 to find an intruder in her Bloomington apartment at 4.30 a.m. armed with a flashlight. He approached her, covering her mouth and threatening her with string around her neck. After she promised not to scream, he demanded she remove her clothing at knife point, forcing her into non-consensual sexual acts. Suddenly stopping, he instructed her to cover her face and left, encouraging her to lock her door and call the police. AM described the intruder as a white male in a black ski mask, a Carhartt coat, and jeans. She also revealed unauthorized access to her and her roommate's license plates by someone identified as Jay Pello before the assault. Additionally, the personal information of AM's parents was accessed by someone logged in as Jay Pelo through the National Crime Information Center database during the same period. KH shared her testimony regarding the April 2003 incident at her apartments, echoing similarities to the previous victim's experience. However, one disturbing aspect stood out. The intruder took her cell phone, directed her to the bathroom, and ordered her to bathe and engage in intimate acts while he watched. Eventually, left alone, KH managed to free herself and contact the police. She described the intruder similarly to the previous victim and identified familiarity in the defendant's eyes in a photographic lineup. Evidence revealed unauthorized access to KH and her father's personal information through the NCIC database six months before the assault, as well as access to KH's information through the Bloomington Police Department's lead system two months before the assault both by individuals logged in as Jay Pilo. AL, the third victim, narrated the January 2005 incident where she woke up to find an intruder wearing a ski mask at the foot of her bed. He forced her onto her stomach, attempting to place a rope cord around her neck, then displayed a knife and made disturbing inquiries about sex toys and beer bottles. After losing interest, he instructed her to bathe and left briefly, returning with a towel and her cell phone. AL managed to call the police after he left, describing the intruder as a white male in dark clothing with a sweatshirt reading England on the front, matching one owned by the defendant based on photographic evidence. During the trial, Alabama positively identified the defendant as the intruder. SK, the fourth victim, provided disturbing testimony about the events in October 2004 and January 2005. She noticed a suspicious man near her building in the early hours after work and later discovered missing window screens. Returning home around midnight on a day off in January 2005, she woke to find an armed intruder in her room, who then subjected her to a horrifying assault. The intruder was described as wearing specific clothing and covering his face. The assault involved disturbing acts and comments, leaving SK traumatized. Eventually freed, she encountered a neighbor and discovered missing items in her apartment. In court, SK positively identified the defendant as the intruder, noting his unique walk matched the man observed near her apartment in 2004. Pelo's heinous crimes against his four victims went unpunished until his sentence in June 2008, resulting in a staggering 440-year jail time. Despite attempts to overturn the verdict in 2011 due to alleged inappropriate evidence, the appeals court upheld his conviction. While his sentence was reduced by 65 years upon recalculation, he still faces a prolonged prison term scheduled for release in 2383. The fact that such a monster remains alive is truly chilling. Ultimately, it was a stranger danger call that led to this monster's imprisonment for 375 years. Despite his intense denials and attempts to cover his tracks, the truth about his double life as a police sergeant came to light. This is the story of how an ex-sergeant received a 375-year prison sentence. Following the disturbing account of the consequences of excessive force, we now look at Officer Andrew Mamone's questioning. In this video, we look into the interrogation of Mamoni and the subsequent internal affairs investigation revealing his improper use of force. But for now, we go back to February 4, 2019, at around 8 p.m., when Mamoni, accompanied by Officer Jay Seitz, encountered a suspicious situation during a routine patrol. The driver, Tarek Green, remained cooperative and calm during the traffic stop. However, his passenger, who identified himself as Cary Grant, displayed extreme nervousness. Suspicions heightened as it was discovered that Cary Grant was using an alias and had a criminal record. Officer Seitz, 
responding to Grant's behavior, instructed him to exit the vehicle, subsequently placing him in handcuffs. Attempts to locate Grant in the system proved challenging due to the use of an alias. Officer Mamone successfully identified the passenger's real name as Daquan Grant in the system. Sensing the approaching consequences, Grant, aware of the trouble he faced, made a desperate attempt to flee the scene despite being handcuffed. Officer Mamone and Madison chased Grant on foot, leading to his eventual fall. Mamone discharged his taser to prevent Grant from fleeing further. During the chase, Grant managed to reposition his handcuffs from the back to the front due to their looseness, which is against safety protocol. Upon recapture, Mamone and Madison instructed Grant to return to the ground and correct the handcuff position. Grant claimed inability due to the cuff's placement, provoking Mamone to threaten with pepper spray. When Grant continued to resist, Mamone forcibly adjusted the cuffs around his legs. The interrogation surrounding this encounter raises numerous red flags, including the cuffing, tasing, and threatening actions taken by Officer Mamone. Following an internal affairs investigation, Mamone was summoned for an interview on May 28, 2019, to provide much-needed clarification regarding this incident. Please state and spell your first and last name for the record. Uh, Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W, Mamone, M-A-M-O-N-E. And how long have you been with us at OPD? Uh, over three years. And did you have law enforcement prior to that? Yes, ma'am. Over two years at the city of Sanford. Any more? Nope. Okay. Where are you currently assigned? Uh, vehicles for hire. Where were you assigned when um, the incident occurred on February 4th, 2019? West Patrol Division, Golf Alpha Mids. And how long were you in that spot? Uh, up to uh, the month of March of this year. March. From so, the date of hire. Okay, so you transferred somewhere else in March? Yeah, I transferred to East Patrol Division, Kilo Alpha Mids. Okay. Um, we're here reference IR 1933. This NOI is in reference to a possible violation of RM 800-2 arrest, subsection C, treatment of prisoners. Did you have an opportunity to review the body camera footage related to this incident? Yes, ma'am. Did you review it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, the other two officers in this video, these are officers Madison and Sites. Is that correct? Correct. Were you riding solo or two-man? Two-man capacity. And were you the driver or the passenger? Passenger. Um, so originally you all conducted a traffic stop, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and then at some point you got them both out of the car and you were trying to identify who the passenger in the car was, correct? Correct. We established probable cause for a search. Okay. Um, while you all were standing, I think you were still inside the vehicle and officers Madison and Sites were standing up and you were eventually able to um, get a positive identification on the passenger, correct? Correct. Um, at that time, he took off running away from you guys, correct? Correct. Tell me what happened after that. Uh, the Mr. Grant, the suspect, the passenger in the car who I was coming to identify, was looking back. Uh, based off the false identification he provided, I used that as clues through the mugshots program to try and find his real identity. Upon finding his real identity, I guess he picked up on my uh, verbal and nonverbal cues that I had positively identified him. Uh, once I stepped out of the car, he began to run at a full sprint, I guess it would be like northwest from us, towards the entrance of Timberleaf and Greenbelt, which is uh, Timberleaf Apartments. Okay, and then what happened? Uh, due to the fact he was providing an act of physical resistance, I deployed my electronic control device after he fell, uh, popped up, and then attempted to flee again. Uh, it had a positive effect of him going to the ground. He didn't fully lock up, but he did go to the ground, which then Officer Madison and I were able to use hands-on techniques to keep him from getting up and trying to flee again. Okay. So we, you to get him under control, and you eventually stand him up, and you all walk back towards where Officer Sites is, correct? Correct. When he goes to the ground, he flips his handcuffs. His handcuffs are oh, on the sorry, front, yeah. which is mm -hmm. problematic, of course. And then myself and Officer Madison walk him back to the patrol vehicles and the original scene of the traffic stop. Okay. What happened when you get back to the original site of the traffic stop? Uh, Mr. Grant is placed in on the ground in a kneeling position, and he is told to put his handcuffs back behind his back. Is that how you were taught to handcuff somebody? I was not trained on having a suspect 
replace his handcuffs from the front to the rear after he has reversed them, after he has flipped them from back to the front. I have not been trained. The interrogation begins with Mamoni recounting the incident confidently, but his demeanor shifts when the topic of handcuffing arises. He admits to being untrained, attributing his weak initial attempt at handcuffing Grant to this deficiency. This weakness enabled Grant to maneuver his cuffs to the front easily. How do you normally handcuff a person if they haven't been handcuffed? If they are not handcuffed, mm -hmm. you handcuff them behind the back. Okay, what if they say the handcuffs are twisted or hurting them? How do you unhandcuff them to readjust it? How would I have not been trained on on handcuffing a suspect based on his complaint of pain. Have you ever had to adjust a handcuffed on a person? Yes. How? When they're behind his back. How? By placing my handcuff key in the handcuff and adjusting them behind his back. Okay. So he's on the ground and you tell him to put his hands back and behind him and what does he say? He fails to comply with the order. What does he say? Uh, you'd have to play the camera for me oh. to repeat verbatim what he said. And even then, you just have to listen. I don't know for memory. As Mamone's responses decline, the interrogator decides to jog his memory by playing the body cam footage of the encounter. However, due to the nature of the internal investigation, the actual footage is unavailable. Get this handcuffs back behind him. Where do you think you're going to go? Y'all going to run us with handcuffs on. Now you're going to stop. Now you're going to drop down to your knees. Now you're going to fix your handcuffs. Go put them back behind back. Just can't let him go. Put him behind your back. Go on. You're the one who got him in front. You tell me. Put him under your knees. Put him on your back. If you do anything other than I say, you get sprayed in the face. You just say if I move. Put him behind your back. You just say if I move, you're going to spray me. You're going to put those behind your back. He might have to come. What's wrong with one case running? Oh, no. He's just, he just likes him. Go ahead, put, put those. How did you get him out? How did you get him out? Hey, hey, hey. You shut your mouth. You shut your mouth. Put those on your knees, slip them on your knees, and around your back. If you gotta go to your side, go to your side. You just, you just. Do what you gotta do to put your handcuffs behind your back. How's that? Look, I'm gonna lay you down, and you gonna, you gonna do what you gotta do. There you go. Now put your legs to the cuffs. Yeah, but I'm trying to, like, I feel like I cannot move. I swore, sir. I, you let me in my, I swore. Like, put them behind your back. Oh my god, that's before. Put him behind your back. Go on. Look at me. Look at me. I'm trying to, bro. You're not even trying. Not even trying. So he says he's trying to, right? That's what he says. He apparently made no physical attempt, but he says he's trying. Yeah, 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 you do see a little when it pans back and forth. When he originally laid on slide, he... I can't see his body on your body camera right and during none of this. I'm like, I can't see his body. I see his foot. Yeah, that, oh, exactly. So you see his foot. I, I recall from him with his legs outstretched, not attempting to even bring his knees to his chest to flip the handcuffs. Okay. And he says he can't. Yeah, but he hasn't physically tried, and he says he can't. Correct. Okay, well, there's some things that I know I can't do. Without I having tried, but I understand what you're saying. Ryan, you're saying you didn't try. Correct. You want to do it, you want me to do it for you. Look at me, look at me. I tried to, bro. You're not even trying. Not even trying. I tried to. Not even trying. Ryan. You're stuck? I'm about to unstuck you. You want to do it, you want me to do it. What does that mean, I'm about to unstuck you? I can't recall it because I can't see him. You said it. What does it mean? I, I can't recall because I can't see his. He said, I don't know what he means by I'm stuck, so therefore I don't recall what I meant by I can't unstuck you. And why were you going to pepper spray him? If he provided physical resistance, my use... Mamone's actions of forcing Grant to reposition his handcuffs and threatening him with pepper spray raise serious concerns. According to the law, pepper spray should only be used in situations of self-defense or to prevent escape. Grant, being of short stature and already handcuffed, posed neither a threat nor had the means to escape. Therefore, Mamoni's untimely threat with pepper spray is unjustified and warrants accountability. Shut your mouth. You shut your mouth. Put those on your knees, slip them on your knees, and around your back. If you gotta go to your side, go to your side. Do what you gotta do to put your handcuffs behind your back. How's that? Look, I'm gonna lay you down, and you're gonna, you gonna do what you gotta do. There you go, now put your legs to the cuffs. Yeah, but I'm trying to, like, I feel like I cannot move. I swore, sir. I, he let me in my, I swore. Like, put him behind your back. Well, what is he 
finger on what? Swear it? Yeah, that's what he said. Go Look at me, look at me. I tried to, bro. You're not even trying. I swore. Put him behind your back. Oh, my God. I swore. What was the purpose of shaking the pepper spray? I, I don't recall. I want to shake him. Pepper spray. Go Okay, he said, I cannot. And now you're forcefully pulling his leg through the handcuffs. Why are you pulling his leg through the handcuffs? To get them repositioned to the rear. He said that he couldn't and that he was yelling because it hurt. We don't know if he was yelling because he was hurt. I can yell right now. It doesn't mean I'm in physical pain. He was yelling as you were pulling his leg through the handcuffs. Correct, he was. So that wouldn't indicate that it was hurting him? Not necessarily, man. Why else would he be yelling? For any various reasons. Draw a crowd. They see if you get attention of people the apartment. That's a common thing that we see when we're out on patrol. People will scream even in the back of a patrol car just to get people to the scene. Okay. The detective now focuses intensely on the reason behind Grant's scream. It's evident that his screams were not just random, but came from the pain of pushing his leg through his cuffed hands. This point becomes the central point of the interrogation as the detective continues until she receives a valid explanation from Mamoni. No, you can't. Bro, I tried. You're not trying. Bro. You just did. Bro, I just I... saw you do it. Love, bro. No, that's all right. He said, I'm trying. I can't. And you're still forcefully pulling his leg through. Why are you still pulling his leg through? Same answer to get his handcuffs repositioned to the rear. But he's saying that he can't do it. Why are you pulling his hand through? If it's hurting him and he says he can't do it, it's not going to work. We don't know if it's hurting him. And the same answer to put his hands behind his back. We'll get it. We'll get it. Go on, see your foot through. I see people do this every day. Ah! Come on. Come on. Stop. Put yourself fighting me and just do it. I love, bro. Yeah, I, I'm going with you, bro. Like... No, you're not. Put your foot around. around. That wasn't that hard. Now do the other one. Do the other one. Put the handcuffs back behind your back. Go on, do the other one. I'm not taking this cuffs off. Your cuffs aren't going back. You already ran once. I ain't going to take them off. Put your other foot. I'll do the other one. So you didn't want to reposition the handcuffs because you haven't been trained or because he already ran once? I hadn't been trained in repositioning a suspect who has fled from the scene, who has flipped his cuffs on the ground to reposition him in his back, ma'am. Okay, so you didn't have control of the prisoner? No, I never said we didn't have control. I said I never I'm asking trained. you, did you have control of him? I can't say we did. It's not a trick question. Just well, it is because it depends on your definition of control. Was he free to go? No, ma'am, he's detained. Did you have physical control of him? Like I said, that determines on your definition of control. If I put him in the back of my patrol car, would you say I have physical control? But I don't, even though he's detained in the back of the patrol car. Can he, is he free to leave? No, he's detained, ma'am. Okay, um, is he under arrest in the back of the car? Yes, at this point he's under arrest. Okay, so what was stopping you from unhandcuffing him and putting the handcuffs behind his back? I've never been trained to do that. You've never been trained to unlock a pair of handcuffs? Not from a person who has fled and lied about his name. That has nothing to do with you unlocking a pair of handcuffs. Nothing. Have you been trained to unlock handcuffs? To unlock handcuffs? Yes. Not when they're from Have his body. Have you ever been trained to unlock handcuffs? That's all I'm asking you. Not in the front of That's a person's going. body. Can we take a break? You sure can. 10.50 hours. The absurdity of Mamoni's claim becomes apparent. As a trained officer, he should be capable of unlocking handcuffs regardless of the circumstances. There's no magical interruption preventing him from doing so. Tension increases as the interrogation approaches a critical stage, but before things escalate further, the union representative intervenes, requesting a break. This pause allows Mamone to collect his thoughts, apologize, and fix the situation. However, rather than opting for damage control, Mamone's decision to continue the altercation outside the room only worsens matters. Yeah, 
The interrogation concludes with an intense frustration coming from the interrogator. However, it's essential to first witness how the interrogation comes to an end. This context will provide a clearer understanding of the events that unfold. We are back in the ante room at 10.54 hours. Um, at what point did you realize um, that Mr. Grant had a warrant? I believe just after Sergeant Ospina shows up to do his response to resistance. So the handcuffing and the hand, moving the handcuffs around, all of that was already done, right? And he was in by the car? He's being interviewed by Sergeant Ospina by the Ford Explorer. So the handcuffing thing was done on the ground? Correct. And what was his warrant for? Uh, attempted homicide out of North Charleston, South Carolina. Officer Dunlap? Can we back the video all the way up to the beginning, please? Looking for when they ran. Mm -hmm. It's around 2813. Where's the uh, 20? I'm offering a first day just like this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's because your face is in dirt. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down, you're going to get it again. Did you hear him wince in pain when he pulled his hands up to the front? Yes, sir. Okay. That's it. Do you want to clarify or add any statements made by you during this interview? No, ma'am. Is the testimony you provided true and correct? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any additional identifiable witnesses that may have evidence of material fact in this investigation? Uh, none of the ones listed here on the sheet. The abrupt conclusion of the interrogation, particularly in light of the altercation outside, suggests a connection between the two events. One plausible theory is that Mamoni participated in the interview under the assumption that it was a routine procedure intended to explain the incident rather than face rigorous questioning. As the interview transitioned into a full-blown interrogation and Mamone felt targeted, tensions escalated, ending in the need for a break. This theory gained support from the interviewer's statement after leaving the room, hinting at underlying tensions and unexpected confrontations during the interrogation. Oh, okay. So my question was, here's the question, have you ever been taught to put a key in a handcuff and unlock it? That is a very simple question. That's all I ask. The interviewer's statement upon leaving the room suggests a possible justification of her line of questioning to a superior officer who may be pressuring her to stop such questions. This explanation aligns with her frustrated return to her seat, indicating a realization that the interrogation was merely a formality rather than a thorough internal affairs investigation. 
The theory gains further weight when considering that despite Mamoni's actions being deemed unreasonable, he received only a 24-hour suspension without pay, implying a lack of serious consequences for his misconduct. It's indeed shocking to consider that Mamone's lack of ability in basic procedures and his actions resulting in harm to a suspect warranted such minimal consequences. The lack of media coverage surrounding his case further highlights the ignorance surrounding instances of police misconduct. The revelation that all discipline charges against Mamone were overturned and his grievance was granted shows a concerning trend of leniency within the disciplinary process. Closing the case without strict consequences raises questions about accountability and transparency within law enforcement agencies.